Welcome to Why Public Service, a podcast of the R Street Institute, a free market think tank in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Kevin Kosar, and each episode I speak with an individual who made the choice to participate in governing our nation. Some of my guests have worked for the government. Others have toiled in various private sector organizations, including think tanks, philanthropies, and political groups. All of them share the same goal, however, which is to improve our country through public service. Today's guest is Mario Biovides, Director of Policy Initiatives at Naleo Educational Fund, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that facilitates full Latino participation in the American political process, from citizenship to public service. Mario has held multiple positions in public service himself, including working for a U.S. Senator and a commissioner and a school board member in Miami. He also was a field director for the Libra Initiative, a group advocating for the principles of economic freedom to empower the U.S. Hispanic community. You can learn more about Mario Biovides by visiting naleo.org. Mario, welcome to the Why Public Service podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Kevin. Happy to join you. As our listeners have heard, you've held various positions in public service over the past 15 years. For today's episode, I want to speak with you primarily about your work at Naleo. So my first question for you is, how did you come to work at Naleo? And what was your career path? Sure. Well, I mean, my career path had nothing to do with policy or politics from the get-go. I had just graduated from the University of Miami as a film major. I wanted to be the next Stanley Kubrick. Obviously, that didn't happen. I took a job at a local TV news station writing for their newscast, pretty much everything that went on the teleprompter. And I was highly dissatisfied with that job. And I decided this is going to take me moving to California or New York. And I wanted to stay in South Florida. I'm from Miami originally. I always knew that I I was passionate about politics. So a lot of folks pointed me to to get involved in in, in politics. And uh, I decided to volunteer with uh, Mel Martinez, who uh, was running as the first Cuban-American to to prospectively join the the United States Senate. Uh, Luckily, uh, he won. And uh, right off the bat, I was working in the U.S. Senate. But throughout the process, I got tons of experience doing grassroots campaigning, got exposed to a lot of great mentors and and folks in the field. Uh, Florida being a battleground state, there was always a lot of high profile folks willing to take you under their wing. So that was uh, crucial for for my development and kind of forging my, my career path. After my experience in the Senate, I had a chance to really hone in on my grassroots skills a little more. I was the regional director for the Republican Party of Florida for years. I had the chance to work in for municipal commissioners, for mayors. I even worked for uh, Carlos Corbello back when he was a uh, school board member in Miami-Dade County. Lastly, in the grassroots world, I, I was uh, given a chance to work as the Eastern Regional Director uh, grassroots director for the Libre Initiative. I thought we were doing a lot of cool, innovative grassroots advocacy and, 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 and approach back then. And uh, luckily, we, we did a lot of good work in the East Coast, and I was promoted to, uh, to national grassroots director. I had that role for a few years. Really got to know about a lot of issues that were impacting, especially Hispanics across the United States. And it led me to want to study up more on policy. I felt that I had gotten to a point in grassroots advocacy where I, I was contributing as much as I possibly could, and, and I thought I, I need to really develop my, my policy chops. So as, as most of us, as it happens to most of us in our career, we get antsy, we want to move on to something else. And um, I started just managing campaigns again after my uh, work at Libre, and Naleo's they let me know uh, through, through various friends and connections that they had a lot open in their DC office uh, to do a lot of impact work. Uh, a lot of it was with, with state legislators, interviewed for that. And, and really from then on, I've, I've really gotten to see policy-wise and even governance-wise some of the issues out there that really impact our communities and their abilities to do good work for their constituents. And just recently, I was given the opportunity to um, become the director of policy initiatives at the organization. I've been with them now for three years. And a lot of what we do really focuses on, on issues that, that impact 
Latinos and, and the full participation of them in the American political process. What are your responsibilities as the director of policy and issues at Naleo? So I manage our, mainly I manage our diversity and inclusion portfolio. Right now, Congress is, is having a hard time uh, making sure that, that their congressional workforce looks like America. So we want to make sure that we have a more diverse congressional workforce. Part of what we do is we put together a, a staff up, a Congress legislative academy every year uh, that helps folks who currently work in Congress and are of color an opportunity to develop uh, their skills so that they are considered for more senior positions on, on Capitol Hill. We also advocate for issues that lead to increased diversity in, in uh, the congressional workforce as well. You know, we've led advocacy on the establishment of a House Office of Diversity and Inclusion, trying to do the same thing in the Senate. So that's mainly the portfolio that I handle. However, there are a couple of issues, you know, that, that impact Latinos, mainly uh, Census 2020, naturalization issues, and, and voting rights. Uh, these are all issues that I also help our policy and research team uh, lead advocacy on. What does the average day look like for the director of policy initiatives at Naleo? And I'm talking pre-COVID since right. post-COVID, most of us are still in lockdown. But pre-COVID, yeah. what, what, would, what did your day look like? Lots of Hill visits. Um, we wanted to make sure that all the members and, and a lot of staff knew that these programs existed, like staff of Congress. Also, you know, work together with, with a close uh, group of allies in, in different cohorts that, that are committed to diversity and inclusion. So uh, a lot of Hill visits to let folks know what's out there, what we're doing, uh, and how, what we can do to help them. I would say that the rest of the time when we're not meeting with folks, a lot of it is reading and research on, you know, the latest trends in the corporate world when it comes to diversity. How can we implement that? In, in Congress. It's easier said than done um, because it doesn't easily translate to, to Congress. Then writing a lot of advocacy tools uh, to help folks, and again, not just limited to diversity, but with all the other aforementioned issues. And then, you know, some administrative tasks as well. Um, but again, mainly it's just a lot of meetings. As, as you know, Kevin, you know, networking is such a big component of what we do. So just making sure that people know that we're out there doing this work, I would say that's the, the, the main day-to-day -day activities that, that I have. After 15 years of working in both advocacy and policy now, what lessons have you learned about governance in the United States? That's a, that's a great question. I mean, I'm lucky enough to see it from both sides of the coin. You know, uh, coming from the grassroots world, a lot of us are optimistic and uh, in thinking, you know, we can, we're going to get in there, we're going to change the system, we're going to make sure uh, that, that we take care of all these problems. But from the get-go, you see that the structure just doesn't necessarily lend itself to that and doing that in, in that sort of timing. The biggest lessons I have learned is I wish early on in my career I knew that there were resources out there that would prepare you for this. I'm going to give you an example. Naleo, not that I want to just tout what we do, but we provide governance uh, training to newly elected officials, uh, mainly uh, state legislators, mainly uh, folks in, in that deal in the world of education, school board members, municipal leaders. Going back through, through, through my time, you know, I, I worked with some folks that, quite frankly, uh, could have used that, that training. And uh, even myself as a staffer could have used it too. And also one, one thing that I see is that a lot of electeds actually end up sending staff uh, to these trainings. But I, I think it's imperative that both the elected and the, the staffer attend these trainings to make sure that, that they're caught up with, with the latest governance trends. When, when I first was working for a municipal official, quite honestly, it sounds obvious if the mayor comes and he lets you know that there's an opportunity to, to be appointed as chair of the commission. That sounds great, but we had no idea what that entailed. <laughs> and uh, if I had a, a time machine, I can, I can go back in time. Our work would have looked completely different 
in, in how we manage commission meetings based on my understanding of the rules now, you know, and I think we could have accomplished a whole lot more things for, for our constituents. I also see that there are a lot of issues with oversight and accountability. Again, I, I th- lots of people have great ideas, but uh, when it comes to implementation, um, because of, of sometimes, you know, the lack of understanding of about governance that rules that particular body, they never come to fruition or they're never done in the way that was initially intended. I really do think that training uh, beforehand in this will go a long way into making these issues a, a little better. Yeah, I think that is an important lesson learned. Um, I think it's very easy for those of us who um, want to affect change in our country or in our communities to approach government as if it is just a kind of delivery system for good ideas. And if we just push those good ideas into it, well, we're going to get good policy outputs and society is going to get better. In reality, as you've learned and I've learned, is much more complex than that. So in your work at Naleo, you're the director of policy initiatives. What's the toughest part of your current job? Well, I mean, just based on the issues that that we work on, you know, talking about census, naturalization, you know, diversity. As you know, Kevin, you're not always going to be successful in moving these things along or even uh, seeing them come to fruition. You may see it later on and your work had some impact, hopefully, in, in, in that issue or, or that uh, movement coming to fruition, but it's discouraging sometimes, you know, knowing full well the impact that will have on American communities and on people to see things not come to fruition. It can be discouraging. It can be heartbreaking. I will also say another thing is a lot of these organizations are bipartisan or nonpartisan. So everybody, including myself, we all have our political biases. We all have our passions. We all have all the issues that we really care about. But the reality is you, once you enter the sphere, you have to be open to working with everyone if you truly want to be successful. That sometimes means you need to compromise on on things that you may be passionate about or figure out very savvy ways on on making sure they're still talked about or or addressed. You want to be vocal about a lot of these issues, but sometimes you can't. You can't because you want to make sure that you open a a respectful and and meaningful line of dialogue with with all of your allies on, on certain issues. So, you know, and, and as you know, Kevin, today we, we live in a social media world and you see a lot of people putting their opinions out there. And sometimes you want to do the same because, you know, you're human and, and, and you're passionate. Everyone's watching. So you just can't, uh, sometimes it's, it's difficult, right, to, to, to keep your mouth shut, for lack of a better term, and um, wait it out and, and, and see if, if there's other ways of addressing the issues that are not just pouring your heart out there in, in social media, for example. That's one of the things I struggle with. I'm not sure about, about you. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a tough balance to strike. You are passionate about change, but you have to realize that change is not going to happen unless you're able to persuade others. And persuasion is a delicate art. Simply blasting out tweets or shoving your opinion in other people's faces uh, and expecting them to just convert is uh, not a good path. Uh, typically to getting what you want. So my closing question for you today, Mario, why public service? You're a talented guy. You could have chosen another career path, but you didn't. I'm so lucky to have come from a very supportive family. Growing up, I really didn't have to face much hardship. I I got to go to some great schools. In fact, my, my parents themselves, they own private schools in South Florida. You know, I had great teachers, a great support system growing up. And I just want to make sure People have access to the same things I had access to when I was growing up, knowing full well that I'm in a position where I can do that, where I can be a voice for those who don't have one, where I can leave behind a positive legacy. I, I think you can't ask for, for anything else in life, especially if, if you know, you're, you're given the opportunity to, to do it. I mean, it thrills me every day even thinking through sometimes how hard it is when you don't get your way right, that I'm just involved in something that's much greater than myself. And I'm able not just to advocate for issues that I'm passionate about, 
but issues that I know are really helping people. And in the meantime, again, thanks to the uh, fact that I've been able to move up the ladder, I've been able to train folks. I've been able to mentor folks as well who are also seeking these opportunities and, and looking to develop their careers themselves so they can be uh, the most effective advocates that they can for the issues they're passionate about. So all those things really is, is why I still, to this day, love the fact that, that I'm involved in public service. It's hard work, but it's rewarding work. Mario, thank you for all you do. And thank you for joining me today on the Why Public Service podcast. Thanks again, Kevin. I really appreciate it. And, and I wish everyone out there luck while they seek uh, their, their own career path. Thank you for listening to Why Public Service, a podcast of the R Street Institute. Please subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends. Even better, rate and review us on iTunes so we can reach more listeners. Tell us what you thought about it and who we should interview next by finding us on Twitter at RSI. If you want to know more about R Street, sign up for our newsletters at www.rstreet.org. I'm your host, Kevin Kosar. Thank you to producer William Gray and editor Parker Tant from parkerpodcasting.com.